Coming up on Need to Know, it's likely among one of the most asked questions of news outlets. Why did the media cover this story and not that one? Members of local media join me to discuss what gets covered, what doesn't, and why. Also on the show, we'll learn whether some efforts to close the gender gap in the fast-growing world of tech are working. And one area school says its focus on reducing suspensions and increasing student ownership of actions and behaviors is working. The alternative to suspension. That story just ahead on Need to Know. If it bleeds, it leads. That's a common phrase associated with local and national news coverage. The idea is that the more shocking, violent, or flashy a story may be, the more likely it will lead a newscast, land on the front cover of a newspaper, or be the top story on any given news site. But is there more to the story than that? Joining me to discuss the role of media in our, in our society, how local news outlets determine the stories that make the list for coverage and those that don't, and much more, is Randy Gorman, news director at WXXI, Rachel Barnhart, anchor and reporter for News 8, Rain Shakur, morning show co-host and music director for WDKX, and Scott Norris, consumer experience director for The Democrat and Chronicle. And thank you all for being here. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. So to begin, Randy, you've been in the news business for decades, so I'm not trying to we age you here. We won't talk about years. Okay. <laughs> A long time. With that being said, right. how would you define the role and purpose of local media? I think uh, it's basically to inform, but I think each of our missions, as we'll probably talk about, varies a little bit uh, just in the types of formats that we have and the types of audiences. But I would say the basic role would be to inform, at times even to entertain, uh, and, and basically to try to bring uh, the world at large a bit closer to people and, and let them know how it's affecting them. I know I've, I've heard the news defined as, or described rather, as this information tool that can be helpful and also harmful. Uh, it's interesting, I came across this quote from Malcolm X. He said, the media is the most powerful entity on earth because they control the minds of the masses. And then Hillary Clinton once said, if I want to knock a story off the front cover of a paper, I just change my hairstyle. So I want to know, does local media, does local news have that much weight and influence? I think it does have a lot of power. We we reach a mass audience, so we do have a lot of power to um, to when we, when we choose our stories and what to cover every single day. We are wielding influence, and so that's the that's the first step. It's not just what we put on the air; it's it's the choices of what we cover every day. So yes, I do think we have a lot of power, but I also think that our audiences, especially in the age of social media, they're not dumb. They hold us accountable every single day. Now they are able to communicate with us immediately about what we're covering and what they think of our work. So it kind of leads me into the stories that we do cover and, and why we cover them and then the stories that we don't, that don't make news. So what type of decision making then goes into what gets on the news, what gets discussed on the radio and that sort of thing? You know, it's really, uh, there's really no one simple answer to that. Um, and it's really more of an art than it is a science. There's everything from going back to, uh, you know, we're kind of in an un, uh, a new era where we have data going back now 11 years that we can look at and we can look at audience trends and what their interests are and uh, what we cover. We get press releases every day. We go through a, a stage of talking about that. You know, what do we cover? What don't we cover? What affects more people? Um, what are the stories we have to tell? What's important to the community? So really there's a whole bunch of factors that, that go into the decision making. I'd like to say it's just one thing, mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's a group of us that talk every day and really uh, try to boil it down and take all those pieces of information into account and then decide what are we gonna cover digitally? What are we gonna cover in print for us? You know, and, and, and how that all balances out. I, mean, I, th I think it goes down to knowing your audience, like you said, and I mm -hmm. think it goes to knowing your community as well. 
and knowing what their needs are and how to address their needs properly. Because a lot of times what we get at WDX is people feel like they don't trust the media, like media isn't gonna give you the full story of what is going on in their world and their life. So those are some of the things that we come into and that's how we choose our stories and what we talk about daily. I can tell you that we start every uh, every day at 9.30 in the morning with a morning meeting. Every, all the entire staff is in the newsroom and we lay out the agenda for the day. There are things that we have scheduled. People send us press releases. We have an event going on at a certain time. There are ideas reporters bring to the table that are not scheduled that we have to set up. and. One of the biggest things that influences what we cover every day, frankly, is resources, staffing. We cannot cover everything. We, it's not only staffing, but we only have a, a newscast with a certain amount of time. That's why you don't see news stories that are typically three or four minutes. So it's always a balancing act. And I just wanna say one thing about what interests our audience. Another thing that we balance is you have to, people like the ice cream, but you also have to give them the vegetables. Right. Right. And sometimes the right. vegetables aren't as interesting, but they're important to, to an informed community, maybe the government stories, and it's our job to tell people why they should care. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, there is always that balance. There are stories that are very important to our community that we have to cover, because if we don't cover them, if you don't cover them, nobody does, right? Um, so you really have to take that into account, too. We really do have an important role in this community, and we have to reflect the community, and we have to, we have to really uh, make sure we're covering what's important. One advantage that I think uh, probably everybody would agree here uh, for us at least, and again, you mentioned I've been in the business a long time, with radio, even with public radio in the past, you have a very finite amount of time to, to cover some stories. Mm -hmm. And some stories like today, in fact, we've been talking about a science story coming out that involves a lot of complexity. Uh, we have the option of, of leading people to our website where we can put, as we did the other day, mm -hmm. uh, explainer videos, talk about photonics, talk about things like that, where we can offer more in-depth than, than you can get on however long our segments are. And that's that's a great option for us that we didn't have in the past. Whereas in the past, the newspaper's domain would pretty much be let's have the big, long, explanatory stories. Now we have the same option of let's put you know video, audio, text on the web, and we can really delve into a topic in other ways that we we can really maybe just give you kind of the highlights on the air. But uh, on the website, we can be much more in depth. Are there any external pressures that at all influence stories that get covered or those that don't get covered? I, I think so. I think that there are, I would say, a lack of, for stories that don't get covered for certain aspects of the community. I think when it, it goes to the community here in Rochester, I think it has to do with having a more diverse media. And, and what, that, what I mean by that is producers. Also, because I know, Rachel, you can probably agree mm -hmm. with this, when it, depending on the stories, you're either approved or not approved to say the story. And I think having people in place who understand and, and reflect the community more, I think that's, that's important and that is what ties into the lack of coverage. Yeah. The I was just going to say, yeah. our, our newsrooms do uh, really do value diversity, and we want diverse staffs. But it's not so; it's not as easy as just going out and saying, "Let's hire people of color." There are a lot of barriers right now. There are a lot of institutional biases and barriers that are preventing our newsrooms from being more diverse. For one thing, there just aren't a lot of jobs anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a lot of jobs to go around. For another thing, the pay in a market this size is extremely low, and uh, colleges often encourage you to get internships. It's a huge way to get your foot in the door and a lot of those internships are unpaid and so people can't afford to pursue this line of work so that we have a lot of work to do to create diversity but certainly when we have those morning editorial meetings and we decide what to cover every day of course personal biases are going to play a role and we do the best we can to make sure that we are representative and that we're we're, we're, we're covering the community in a more complete way you had asked about external pressures. I mean, uh, social media has really, has really yeah. become one of those yeah. external yeah. pressures. If we don't cover a story that people think is important, we'll know about it right away. You know, you won't hear about it the next morning in a letter to the editor like you used to. You'll know it immediately. If there's a story you're not on that people believe is important, you'll know about it right now. Um, so that really has been a game changer. Yeah. News is no longer yeah. top down like it used oh, to be. And you, you know, you used to, we used to always decide what people were gonna watch and they had one chance to watch it on the six o'clock news. Now yeah. everything is very flat. People are weighing in constantly about what's important. So to how them. do you balance that out then, right? Because there's tons of information available on social media. How do you sift through 
the fluff, and, and really to find the things that are of substance that, that need to be told. Yeah, I, I think that's that's the trick, and, and like Scott mentioned and Rachel, I think social media is a great sounding board in a way, but it's, it's far from scientific, and as we all know, dealing with social media, uh, you look at Twitter every day, there are a lot of people, you know, just trolling through social media who have opinions, frankly, that can be worthless in a lot of cases, or, or things that are just meant to inflame uh, and not to inform. And I think it's really just incumbent on us as journalists to, to kind of sift through the things that look interesting and follow up, again, within the confines of resources if we have time. But it's not, again, as, as you said before, it, it's an art, not a science. And I don't like to be super reactive to everything. If I see a tweet, especially in, in the kind of format that we have in, in public media, we like to take a step back and maybe this is something we'll pursue over a longer period of time rather than say, let's do a story today on that. Right. Like, take the viral videos of, say, police arresting someone and to, you know, to people watching it, maybe the arrest looks like there was too much force used. Those kinds of things have been going viral quite a bit in the Rochester community. Um, and people are asking us to look into to these videos. Some of them we've looked into and they certainly raise a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Other ones we look into and the, you know when you hear the full story or see the full video unedited video, it's not as much of a story, but I still feel in some ways we play a great role in educating the community and telling them what we found out because people want us to find out the truth. And sometimes the truth isn't the way it appears on social media, and I think we can play a role in that. I, I recently spoke with Tom Proietti, professor of media at St. John Fisher College, and we discussed everything from agenda setting uh, to media censorship. And, and he believes the greatest act of censorship when it comes to U.S. media is story omission and, and not fully digging into stories of depth that impact the entire community. And I'm going to take a look at a portion of that interview right now. You know, even on our local newscasts and, and at the network level, we, you know, we cover, cover weather disasters, we cover, we start covering house fires, you know, and, that's, and we should be covering, you know, the real significant issues of our time, the, uh, the extensive poverty in our inner city, which gets virtually no coverage at all. We cover the crime, but we don't cover the cause. We constantly have this battle between the frivolous and the rich and the deep and the important, and, and it's, it's going on, you know, it's, it's a constant struggle uh, if, we co if we only covered the really complex and torturous and difficult, we'd probably all be on Prozac. So one of the things that we have to do is have a bright spot. Uh, I think what we need also is a really, really deep and extensive kind of media literacy being taught in our schools so that students and future consumers of news can sit there and look at a and listen to a newscast, read a newspaper, a magazine, look at social media, and ask the right questions before they consume that information and, and process it and accept it as fact. So I'd like you to weigh in on this. Something Tom said at the very beginning, we cover the crime, but not the cause. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's really important to us that we do cover the cause. Um, you know, we've had uh, David Riley and Patty Singer working on a poverty series, uh, which is published several times already, and they'll continue to look into that. Um, we're in the third year of our Unite Rochester um, uh, project that looks at issues of race in the city, which also uh, lead into poverty issues and things like that. We take that very seriously, actually. Um, I can tell you, uh, Karen Magnuson, our editor, uh, if she said it once, she says it every single meeting we're at, watchdog and that type of journalism is our number one priority. Yes, we have to also cover the crime that happens, but if we do not take a look at the deeper issues, we're not serving our community. Um, it's very important to us. Uh, there's a huge commitment there to continue to do that. We devote a lot of resources uh, to those projects. You don't see them every day because they take time to develop, right? Those deeper stories don't come out every single day. But we look at them, we talk them, we plan them out, and those issues he talked about were, are very important in our newsroom, yeah. and without they, a yeah. doubt. I was going to say big kudos to the Democrat and Chronicle for, you know, your poverty stories as well as the Unite Rochester and certainly WXXI with Evan Dawson's connection show and Need to Know. You know, you're, you're constantly delving into these things. But as for your regular TV news broadcasts, um, there's a reason we cover crime, house fires, car accidents. It's easy, doesn't require a lot of resources, and um, it's kind of like watching the train wreck. It, you know, it's interesting to viewers for, at that very moment. Those things don't interest me as much anymore because my threshold is always, am I going to remember this tomorrow? Am I going to care about this tomorrow? TV news, as I said, do, we don't have a lot of jobs anymore, and it takes commitment and time to cut to do things that are in depth. Fortunately, I do work at some place that, that cares about these things and, and will allow us that time. But it does, it's not going to happen every single day. I did have one job that wasn't interested in delving deep into things and actually told me that I covered too many things in the city. So, 
you know, you talked about external pressures. Right, right, right. That mm -hmm. is one, and, and that, that certainly demonstrated a bias in my opinion. And I think when you cover crime, not you per se, but when, when crime is covered or poverty is covered, the picture that is painted through media is one particular setting, one particular race. And we all know that crime and poverty happens around the surrounding areas as well. And I know the DNC did an article about Victor and poverty in Victor, and that's huge, you know? And for the first time, you see an article and you're like, well, wait a minute, you know, this happens everywhere. So I think being fair and being in, in, in not admitting that, that, okay, crime and poverty happens outside of the city, it's not just the city, it's not just mm -hmm. a thing where it, it includes African Americans only, because when you ask people who do crime and poverty affect the most, or when you say crime and poverty, what do you picture? Most people do say, African Americans, and that's not the case. Right, right. In this work that we do, there, there's always this threat of uh, continuing to lose trust. And so when we, we investigate, report, cover, mm -hmm. and, and share this information, yet only four in 10 Americans trust the information that we as the media present, and that's from a recent Gallup poll. I wanna know, what gives? Why are we seeing this decline in trust, which has been go going on for the past decade. And, and I'm not going to just pick on social media because we use it extensively to, to promote and talk about our products, uh, but I think that it has further inflamed or cheapened some of the, the news that's out there because it comes now from multiple sources, not only from sources like some of the people around this table, newspaper, TV, WDKX, who actually spend time to get to know their community, but you'll see things from a lot of the infotainment type uh, areas, from people who are just, again, on on the social media sites trying to, you know, inflame or talk about, uh, you know, their own personal biases. And I think people kind of lump that all together and say that is the media. Now they're starting to look at not just the traditional media, they're, they're looking at uh, everything that's online as well and say, look at all the junk out there, how can I trust any of it? And I think that's at least our job, I feel, here mm -hmm. at WX decided to help try to maybe provide a filter and, and some, some balance in what's going on. Yeah, I'd agree. I think everybody around this table will cringe any time any media organization makes a mistake because it all comes back to you, yes. right? Uh, people forget who made the mistake, and all of a sudden it becomes uh, attributed to you, too. Um, so, and that's right. And, and I think even with, uh, with younger users of media now, um, they view media differently, right? It's not the newspaper and the television station and, and, the, and public radio and television, right? It's also the bloggers um, and the people out there on social media that become their news source. And so they sort of lump news into this larger ball than we traditionally well, that's did. That's why Tom, what Tom Peretti said about media literacy was so important because studies have shown that people are now seeking out uh, sources of information that conform with their own beliefs. Right. And some right. of those sources, such as you know bloggers and, because um, anyone can launch a blog now, some of those yeah. sources are not accurate and have very, very deep biases. A great conversation. I want to thank all of you for joining me, and hopefully this created more understanding in terms of the complexities of the work that we do and also affirm the role that we're supposed to play to create public awareness. So a special thank you to all of you, Scott Norris, Rain Shakur, Rachel Barnhart, and Randy Gorman. And we transition now to the tech world, which, as we know it, is male-dominated with very few females in leadership positions. While there are more women adding terms like coder and game developer to their resumes, there are some who say change isn't coming fast enough. Sasha Ann Simons joins us now with more on the push to close the gender gap and gaming technology in particular. Thanks, Helen. The face of the video game industry is slowly changing. Women now make up about a quarter of the people coding and making games. But how do we make room for even more? That's the mission of the women behind Girl Develop It, a national organization working to boost the ranks of women in gaming and create a more level playing field. Take a look. I scheduled a meetup, I scheduled the first class, and uh, we got the traction right away. The expression girl code has a different meaning for the members of Girl Develop It. The national nonprofit is working hard to close the gender gap in technology. I always been, you know, kind of tech a kid. I was, you know, one of those kids that plugs all the VHS at home and, you know, assembles computers. Lena Levine founded the group's Buffalo chapter nearly two years ago. From beginner to advanced, its workshops are almost always sold out. The classes are in-depth, and Girl Develop It offers scholarships to help make them more affordable. STEM like HTML, CSS, intro to the web concepts, intro to the JavaScript, so all the uh, basics that you need for pretty much any coding um, 
job? We have had um, a, one lady get a job as a junior programmer. So yeah. More women are adding terms like coder and game developer to their resumes. Last year, women made up 22% of the game developer workforce. That was double the 11.5% of females in the field in 2009. That says we've made progress, but we still have a long way to go, a very long way to go. Now, the number of women who actually play games is 50%. Eloise Oizan has oh, taught all things game design and development for the last 15 years at Rochester Institute of Technology. And every year, she makes it a point to try and encourage more female students to get in the game. If we have women who come in, if we have people of color who come in and make games, they will make games that appeal to them, and that sort of broadens the conversation. I didn't even know what technology was. No idea. As a kid living in Colombia, South America, back in the 90s, Elizabeth Canis had zero exposure to computers and software. But through the years, technology as she knew it became less scary. When I decided I needed to choose a career, I'm like, I'm going to be a programmer. <laughs> what I thought programming was, was um, learning Microsoft Word. Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint, I would say I'm going to be an expert programming, programmer in these programs. So my first programming class, I almost had a stroke. Canis grew up in New York City, and she says back then computer classes weren't a thing until high school, if you were lucky. Nowadays, she lives upstate and says when she hooked up with Girl Develop It, there was no turning back. Number one, I learned that I was capable because at a certain point I, I felt that maybe I, I was too far behind and I was never going to be able to catch up and perhaps technology wasn't going to be a career path for me. There's a massive video game archive at Rochester's Strong Museum. In fact, it's the world's largest collection. It has genres of games made by both sexes. Some of the most compelling, interesting games now, a movement called Indie Games, Many of those developers are women who are working on those as well. And it's a fresh voice and a sign of a maturing industry. Oizan remembers a time when breaking into the industry as a woman felt impossible. She says those barriers helped her develop a tough skin. The first woman in this situation, the first brown person in this situation, and all of a sudden you have to be not just competent, you have to be more than competent, you have to be super adjective it is in that context because you're representing everybody else. Time to get some work done. <laughs> the women of Girl Develop It say they have more classes on coding, gaming, and mobile apps in the works, and they're pumped about hosting a second hackathon in the spring. But more than anything, the group is optimistic and say women will eventually reach parity with men when it comes to technology. I think so. I think it's just we started later because we didn't have interests earlier. <laughs> <laughs> this story was part of Innovation Trail, a reporting project that explores the link between technological breakthroughs and the revitalization of upstate New York. For more stories, visit innovationtrail.org. Fighting with a classmate, cyberbullying, truancy. These are all school code of conduct violations that could land a student in out of school or in school suspension. According to the American Psychological Association, suspensions are linked to a possible increase in future behavior problems, academic issues, detachment, and dropouts. But a school-based program offered through Rochester Center for Youth provides schools with an alternative to traditional forms of discipline. It's aptly called Alternatives to Suspension. It's a restorative practice to reduce suspensions while incorporating academics and skill building. Here's more on this week's American Graduate Champion, the Center for Youth's Alternatives to Suspension Program. How can I forgive someone who has made me angry? Dialogue, ownership of one's actions, workshops to help students make positive choices. That's what happens here. It's the Alternatives to Suspension Room at Greece Arcadia Middle School. We sit and meet the kids. The center's mission and statement is your issues your way. So we find out what's going on. What's the underlying issue? How can we help you with this? The Center for Youth's Alternatives to Suspension program, also referred to as ATS, uses something called matched intervention. Y'all like smile at them like, ah, I don't like you. 
No, but then you're not using, you're not using, you're using angry words still. It's a tool to match a student's behavior issues, such as fighting, truancy, or cyberbullying, to a workshop tailored to address that particular problem. I was hanging out with um, one of my friends, and I, um, she wasn't the right friend to hang around, so I got um, into something. Then I went to ATS. They didn't judge me for what I did. When they asked me what I think, I got shocked. Like, why aren't they just giving me so much papers and to do and write? I actually felt comfortable um, talking to them about my situation. What words can I say when I am angry? School officials say ATS differs from typical disciplinary programs such as in-school suspension. How? They say it's not about disinclusion, but about building skill sets while incorporating regular classroom academics. After I left, I um, actually felt pretty good because like, I didn't have like a whole bunch of guilt. I actually felt that I can actually change what I did. I started studying more. I started actually caring about my education. Before, before I really didn't care. I'm proud of you, man. Parents are proud of you. According to assistant principal Mason Moore, since implementing the Center for Youth's ATS program at the school three years ago, suspensions are on the decline, and the results of the program are not only being felt by students. We are significantly down. We have a third of the referral rate than we had in the uh, last year. I still have so many colleagues over in high school that came back and said that this year's a uh, group of freshmen seem to have uh, bought into. I think uh, a part of that, when, and by buy into, I mean that we have, uh, we're seeing a decrease in um, behavioral instances. We seem uh, to have a better social, emotional dynamic in our high school hallways, and I attribute some of that to uh, the hard work we're doing with ATS. The Center for Youth's Alternatives to Suspension program is currently operating in city, suburban, and rural districts in and around our region. To learn more, go to centerforyouth.net. This segment was part of our ongoing Need to Know series called American Graduate Champions. We're highlighting individuals and organizations helping area kids succeed on the journey from preschool to graduation. To learn more, go to wxxi.org slash grad. And that's it for this edition of Need to Know. I'm Helen B. and Duty Hofer. Thank you for joining me tonight and throughout the weekend here on WXXI TV. And don't forget, you can also check out this week's show online. Just go to WXXINews.org. Have a good night.